Hello, you. Let me ask you something. Why haven't you subscribed to Class Horrorcast yet? Huh? So, John, can you, you think you I'm not gonna notice? Gateway into well, I see everything. horror movies, I see things like that. Is there something right that now. sticks out as a moment that maybe a The question isn't should you subscribe to Class mm. Horrorcast or not? The question I is, say, uh, did I just subscribe to you? be seeing <laughs> Jaws in the theater. Now enjoy um, the show. As a, I'll as be a, as a kid, and um, the effect that that had on me was was so deep um, and so dark. Welcome back I, to another episode of I Class Horror the, at I'm the beach, host, Aaron, on this week's show, um, I'm and just by couldn't, director, producer, you know, Mr. John even Bowen. have a glass of water or anything water related. Many of you may not know his name. Uh, after no, that, for the rest of the summer, on the film industry. Um, so I think that's you know, movies like US you know if you if you can. Tommy Lee Jones. To help you can bring call Jaws a horror movie. Some people do, life, some people don't. Like the um, but that's that's kind of when I John first, also the driving you know, really, really, really felt it. Uh, I'd certainly seen a lot time. of movies before that. Ship. You know, many of the classics. In 2011, he brought uh, Road Mary's Baby, the director's chair, Exorcist, etc. But I hadn't uh, uh, I hadn't seen them in quite this way where I was at, and you know, at the beach going into that very water in every single day and I just directed the scared the hell out of me. So that was kind of the beginning for me. Followed by directing yeah, I always feel like I had this weird fascination with reborn. being terrified of being brought to the beach every summer, but, but also is fun in my mind, like they'd bring me out and like this, like that old and I would kind of behind go ship. I guess role play a man. Like, wouldn't it be crazy? If John like, has a vast array of skills as a shark, which allow but then also being terrified. Genre genre. His passion and positivity yeah. is infectious, um, and I can't wait to share this conversation. Please welcome Mr. It's, John. Paul. Uh, you know, I, I love that Lovecraft quote. Uh, I'll butcher it, but something akin to the the oldest and greatest fear of mankind is. Um, I'm sorry, the oldest and greatest human emotion is fear, and the oldest and greatest fear is fear of the unknown. And I think that's what, you know, that's always been sort of a, a guiding principle for me, at least in terms of trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm personally scared of, what people might be scared of. Um, and the, the principle that anything that you create in your mind is usually more scary than what you actually see. Mm -hmm. And I think Jaws did that in such a, um, you know, in, in, in such a, an incredible way uh, where they sort of peeled it back, peeled the shark back in a way that allowed you to kind of build it in your imagination as something more horrific than something you might actually even ever encounter. So um, uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's really stuck with me. And I guess thing, you know, throughout your teens and stuff like that, were movies always a huge part of your life? And then at what point did, I guess, the idea of, you know, writing stories and, and that kind of thing, when did that really become more real for you, I guess? Hmm. So um, I'd always, for, for you know, lots of lots of reasons, I think like a lot of writers and directors, you know, sort of used uh imagination fiction as an escape um from a certain kind of reality and so uh i was an avid an avid reader uh my entire life and then and then in high school um i had a very influential film teacher that started to kind of open up my world um in terms of, uh, number one, the kind of movies that I was seeing, more international cinema, more sort of darker, quirkier uh, alternative movies. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondarily began to sort of suggest that this could actually be uh, a career for me, um, which I didn't really take seriously until um, I was in college. Um, so the, the, germ, the germs of it, I guess, started with just being a, a reader and a, and a, and a would-be escapee uh, my, my whole life. But then this teacher and then going to, to a college where um, I'd say five out of seven people went to either law school or Wall Street uh, and kind of left me bereft of, of um, storytelling opportunities where I, in, until the point where I just sort of had to say, fuck it, I'm going to go to Hollywood and, and, you know, not knowing a soul and, and give it a shot. So, um, 
it was a it was a piecemeal progression certainly to getting out to Hollywood and uh, a long journey getting to where I am ups and downs and you know mm -hmm. u-turns and that sort of thing uh, and I guess for for people from the outside looking in some of your earliest work and projects you were involved in were like you know things involving Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, U.S. Marshals like these I suppose what we would consider today and I would imagine at the time these huge blockbuster titles how um I guess, you know, from it being something that you, it was a passion, it was a dream, and then kind of to be in those positions, how did that feel and how did you deal with, I guess, the, like, was there pressure? Was there nerves? Mm, well, I guess I'd, I, to answer that, I'd kind of have to tell the short version of how it all happened, um, which is, um, I left college, as I said, with kind of no prospects or ideas about what to do with my life other than I liked storytelling. And I had this sort of vague, vague notion that, you know, Hollywood and the dream was out there. I grew up in Washington, D.C. So, you know, it was 3,500 miles away uh, and sort of this this myth. Um, and um, I happened to know a couple of people in Washington associated with the film business um, through my parents and, and, um, had a, you know, set up a couple interviews with them and they were very discouraging. Uh, in fact, one of them said the best, the best that you'll ever do, John, is hold a light for someone. Uh, and you're just, you know, they're just hundreds of thousands of people that want to do what you're thinking of doing. What a, what a huge mistake this is. And of course, um, you know, that just had the opposite effect, which was like, well, fuck that. <laughs> uh, and, and kind of, kind of spurred, spurred me on. Um, but I, I came, I came to, to, to LA, to Hollywood, um, kind of at a, uh, the beginning of the turning point between dig, uh, film and digital. So it was sort of an interesting transition time, sort of like it is now in a way, um, and um, I landed a job as a Xerox boy in a library, in a script library. And back then everything of course was uh, on zero, you know, uh, on paper, mm -hmm. uh, three hole punch paper. And I knew that I wanted to do something, you know, writing, directing, but, but that's, you know, it's, it's uh, seen a little bit as a folly and to me, to me as well, I think. But when I started to, to, um, to read these scripts in the library, I had this fantastic opportunity to basically teach myself screenwriting by reading. I mean, we had thousands, thousands of scripts by everyone. This, this company kept a copy of, you know, every script from every movie ever made. Um, and um, I just sort of progressively learned it. And I felt, um, well, maybe this is, this is something that I could do and kind of matched up with some of these dreams as, as a child, uh, as a kid, uh, loving movies. And then this teacher pushed me on and I felt like I could do it. So I taught myself, um, how to, how to screenwrite. And, um, it took, uh, to boil down the story. It took about five years of writing 30, 40 scripts, um, to finally get somebody interested enough, um, to start reading my scripts as an agent. And what, what usually happens is the agent reads the script along with, you know, a million others that they've read that weekend and say, this is really good. I like your writing. What's, what's next. I mean, it's a cliche. And, um, uh, I, after five years of doing this, uh, I was like, fuck, I've got to write something that's going to break through. Uh, so it become, doesn't become about, what's your next one, but about this one. And so I, I actually just sort of did quite a bit of thinking and brainstorming and, and talking and pitching to my friends. And I came up with um, a log line and then a script, which I felt was sort of undeniably commercial mm -hmm. because I wanted to, to break in and it's great writing, you know uh, it's, it's great writing movies, but movies are ultimately about other people to watch. And if you want to make them, you have to get someone to put some money on the table to do it. And so that's kind of what funneled me towards the sort of commercial big budget 
uh, arena at the time. Um, and that um, in the nine, in the early nineties was um, techno thrillers like Tom Clancy, um, Schwarzenegger, Clancy, Die Hard, um, Hunt for Red October, those sorts, those sorts of, of movies that combine some tech with, with big action and, and big kind of 90s character. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote a, a spec script in that vein um, called Man with a Football, um, and that became my calling card and entry point in, into Hollywood. And it was just by – it it pushed me into the big blockbuster realm because that was the nature of the premise, um, which I was using to try to break in. So um, it wasn't any sort of uh, other, other than how can I break in? There wasn't any other logic to it. Uh, it, it was a uh, arena from a story telling perspective that I really loved, but um you know, if I had come up with an equally what I thought commercial idea for, a, a, you know, a supernatural or a horror movie, um, it could have gone those directions as well. It just happened to be that's the one that I came up with. So that's kind of how it all that's kind of how it all started. That led to my first uh, assignment, which was um, the um, sequel to The Fugitive, uh, U.S. Marshals with, with Tommy Lee Jones, et cetera. So that's. You know, that, those are kind of the, the broad stepping stones as to how I kind of got started and why I got started in that vein. And so U.S. Marshals comes out, and <clears throat> from that point then, um, like I would imagine at the time, like, you know, it's this blockbuster event that movie releases. Is it a thing where straight away, you know, people are approaching you for, you got any more ideas? Is there anything next? What's, you know, what's happening? Or... um. Like, how did you avoid, I guess, getting yourself uh, pigeonholed into, yeah, you're just going to be this guy that's going to make this type of movie? Mm. Well, I'll be honest, I was I was very happy at that point in my career to be the guy that would make that type yeah. of movie. <laughs> um, because that's kind of jumping to the head of the line in many ways, certainly mm-hmm. in terms of what you got paid. Um, and, um, it, in many ways I was extremely fortunate to get the sequel to the fugitive as my first assignment. Many people have to wait in line, you know, 20 years to get that. And I guess I was a little dumb, naive and didn't really know, you know, didn't really appreciate, I guess, uh, the incredibly fortunate position that I, that I got in, in, and then, so, from there, I actually, uh, uh, well, prior to that, I had written uh, three spec scripts. This was when the spec market was super hot. And that first script I told you about, Man with a Football, was followed by several more that were also in that techno, villar, uh, techno um, uh, thriller vein. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they sold, and, and a couple of those almost got made. Some of them are still trying to get made. Um, and so I had four, five, six already in this sort of techno thriller bin. Um, and people, I guess, said, well, he can do that. Um, what, you know, what else can he do? And that, that kind of threw me into the script doctoring um, mode as well as writing originals. And the script doctoring mode was what kind of helped me branch out and do some of these different genre movies um, other than the techno thriller movies that I was, you know, known for being able to write. Um, And so that's, you know, it was kind of, um, uh, it wasn't a logically thought out plan. It was more, here's where the opportunity is. Um, I found that I was able to do, uh, I, I was able to be a rewriter as well as a spec writer and in many ways, you know, maybe sometimes do the rewriting of other people's work better um, than, than some of my own specs. And sort of that led to these other, you know, these other projects and many, many uncredited um, 
uh, script doctoring jobs on other big, big movies, um, which were fun to do. But ultimately, especially when you get no credit, you're making a lot of money, but creatively, um, you're more sort of a, uh, you know, a, a, a bit of a cog um, mm-hmm. in, in, in the process. And so I, uh, at, at some point after having some success with this, the doctoring, I sort of said, okay, I've got to stop this, focus on um, specs, my own stuff. And that's when a project called um, The Skulls got made, which was kind of my next step. That was back to something that was personal for me. Um, and I was actually, uh, uh, as I said, I'm going to stop doctoring. I'm going to direct Skulls. That was going to be my first directing project, you know, a good almost 10 years prior to my actual first directing project, Mm -hmm. which is kind of another, it's another story about what, what happened with that. But that was the next, next in this sort of, you know, plateau, you know, uh, up and down roller coaster of trying to maintain my career. And you know, when you had mentioned, uh, you know, rewriting scripts and doctoring scripts, am I right in saying you had um, a fairly big involvement, I guess, in The Fast and Furious? Well, <laughs> that depends on whose opinion you're listening to. I mean, I, I you know, I have, um, uh, I know the truth, um, and it became a little bit controversial because um, after... Uh, Fast and Furious was done. Um, there was a uh, a large lawsuit that had to do with how Universal Studios was promoting the movie Rollerball, who I think uh, who, who whose anniversary was yesterday or something like mm-hmm. that, twentieth. Um, and um, so that kind of led to some um, to sort of some rewriting of history by many, you know, numerous people. Um, but uh, the the fact is that when, um, after we did The Skulls, um, Neil Moritz, producer that I've worked with, original film, um, very prolific producer uh, who did Skulls, uh, I produced Skulls with Neil, and Rob Cohen directed Skulls, and then um, Paul Walker was in Skulls. Um, and we were all like, this, this guy's extraordinarily talented. What can we do with him next? Um, and Neil had found an article that was about street racing in a sort of a somewhat small uh, San Fernando Valley periodical. And um, he brought this to us and said, this would be a great vehicle for Paul Walker and a multi-ethnic cast that could take it, that could, that could really delve into the, the unknown world of street racing in a sort of an exciting and adventurous way. And I read the article and I, I thought Neil was, was right. He has really, really good creative instincts. And um, I said, you know, I think this is a great idea. I'm in Rob Cohen, who we had just worked with. And I, you know, had, had some good success on skulls uh, was interested in, in doing it as well. So we had this core group. Uh, and then I made a, uh, what I would call a somewhat uh, disastrous choice, which was at the same time that th- this was all happening uh, John McTiernan had reached out to me um, and wanted me to do Rollerball. Um, and uh, Rollerball needed, uh, uh, he thought, some work. And so they wanted to br- bring me in as script doctor um, and rewrite Rollerball. And so I had a choice to make. You know, do I, do, do I write the original what became the fast and furious Mm -hmm. off this article, or do I go work with John McTiernan on a, on a go movie uh, on a, on a movie that I revered the original rollerball. Um, And uh, I made the decision um, to go with, with McTiernan and work on rollerball. And uh, so, you know, Neil Rob and the rest of the gang um, uh, went and they, they hired a very, some, some very good writers 
um, to, to work on the, um, on the article. Um, but I kind of stayed on board uh, as I was trying to sort of hammer home the multi-ethnic themes that were important to, to um, the Fast and the Furious and trying to sort of keep the family element alive as we went through all the machinations. So I kind of had a, uh, uh, a, a little bit of a hand in continuing to develop the story, which is why I became executive producer um, on, on that project. And then sort of, I stayed involved, um, throughout the process, throughout shooting and then into post where, um, where I, you know, did, did what executive producers do, which is generally they, you know, they give advice and they, they, they help to try to shape, uh, the ultimate direction of the movie. So I was fortunate from beginning to end to be, involved, but I wasn't, um, you know, a critical day-to-day piece of the movie. And I guess uh, when the dust settled after all of that with Rollerball and, you know, Fast and the Furious, when you come out the other side of that then, were you, uh, I guess, fatigued or kind of like, you know, I just, I'm after getting over all these hurdles and all this kind of up and down, I don't want to call it drama, but... Yeah. A- after that, were you, were you know, were you still a hundred miles an hour? I want to get, I want to get something going again straight away, or was it time to kind of maybe step away and? Well, you know, that's a, it's an interesting question. I guess, uh, I mean, I don't want to sound egotistical, but I guess I'm not really one to be fatigued. You know, the fight and the battle is what in- inspires me, keeps me going, um, and you know, I, I love it. Um, there are certainly times where you question your own, you know, value, self-worth, et cetera, because you're always getting arrows, you know, and, and grenades thrown at you all the time. But I think, you know, there, there has to be a particular resilience to being in Hollywood, especially as a writer and a director to begin with. And, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't sort of, uh, um, I, I didn't start at the ground up and kind of break my way through for nothing to sort of, you know, mm-hmm. so for, for me, it's, for me, it's uh, always a fight, always exhilarating. Um, and you're always going to have a lot of enemies um, and friends. And that's just sort of part of, part of the process. I think a more direct way to kind of answer your question for me is that after after a project is done, there's a um, more kind of a letdown, like I'm not being creative. How do I get to be creative again? Feeling like just for me personally, if I'm not in the trenches trying to sort of create whatever that means in Mm -hmm. this realm, then that becomes very depressing and, uh, and dark and boring. Um, And so like, you know, that's why I'm kind of out there trying to just always sink my teeth into something new to kind of keep that feeling at bay. You're Irish. You understand that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 and and so from, from that point, and then Rollerball had come out, and I think The Skulls 2 had come out at that point, around 2002 maybe? Uh, that, um, sounds, that sounds right. And so then... After that then, and it's something that I personally couldn't wait to ask, was about your involvement in Ghost Ship and kind of maybe a little bit of the backstory on how that came about. And f- funny yeah. actually that this uh, that this chat we're having coincided with, um, I-, I don't know if you can, anyone who's listening to this obviously as a podcast um, won't be able to see, but I-, I will post it on social media. I actually, and it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't because we were going to have this conversation, but I actually had a, a tattoo appointment booked for like the last like six months, and I ha- I had it today. Now it's not finished, but I don't know if you can make that out. Oh, of course I can! Fantastic! Yeah, woo! Um, That's good. Yeah, I know, right? I um, yeah. I'll, I'll post it on on social media for anybody who is listening. But basically, what we're looking at is it's the cover art for Ghost Ship on my inner forearm. 
Fantastic. Wow. Who who did that? Uh, there was a, a tattoo shop in my town called You Meg Tattoos. Wow. Um, so, yeah, as you can tell, it's a, a favorite of mine. It's a, what I would consider a, a comfort movie. I always find myself going back to it when I've had a yeah. shitty day or a shitty week or I just want to, like, get away from the world. I can put that on and just kind of enjoy nice. it. Nice. Fantastic. Well, um, that's, you know, that's, that's really cool. Um, so I, you know, I love, I love ghost ship. I just, it has a special place in my heart. Um, so, uh, when, when I, not to bore you with kind of how I got hooked up with Joel Silver, but no, of um, course. their company was interested in, in me and projects that I'd written that, that, um, you know, they do so many different genres and they, they, they know that I had done uh, script doctoring on some other uh, sort of horror related projects. And that they said, so we've got this project with Steve Beck directing and I love 13 ghosts and what mm-hmm. he did with that. And I said, um, so yeah, so send me the script. And it was by a writer named Mark Hanlon. Uh, and Mark is a very talented writer um, uh, who, who's, um, whose script was much more kind of atmospheric, um, and cerebral than I think Joel, who is very kind of commercial and big, um, was excited about. And he wanted to sort of take, um, what he felt were kind of the, the atmospheric, wonderfully scary qualities of Mark's script and give it a little bit of kind of commercial juice, if you'll if you'll forgive me. Um, and so, um, when I came aboard, there was no beginning. Okay, there was a very different way that our that our that our uh, you know family of scavengers got on got mm-hmm. involved and got onto the boat. And so, uh, I we. We, meaning Joel and myself, um, uh, and then Steve, you know, but but mostly Joel driving this. Um, he said we need to have the most uh, shock, credible. You'll never forget opening of any horror movie of all time, and that's how Joel like. That's how he thinks. You know, he's just like so so ambitious. Um, and so exacting and, and, and pretty tough, um, cause he wants things to be really good. And so, mm-hmm. you know, he said, um, because they'd taken a lot of different pitches. So how it works is Joel wants to, you know, the producers want to change. They talk to the original writer, then they have a, you know, nine, 10, 20 writers come in and pitch the opening, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I was fortunate that I came on board and then the idea of the opening, it needs an opening. So I was already kind of involved and I then pitched this opening um, to, to Silver um, and to the, the powers that be and they really liked, they liked the opening. Um, but they had a lot of technical questions like how do you, you know, is it, is it believable that you could cut everyone in half almost instantaneously? Like all of, how's this going to happen without looking goofy? And so I spent some time uh, going down to Long Beach to the Queen Mary um, and uh, spending time on the deck, the, you know, the, the decks and sort of look, looking at all the winches and the machinery and how it was set up. And the idea of kind of seeing the, and and machinations work invisibly together to sort of conspire to this moment where it goes tight and it cuts everybody kind of came to mind. And I'm like, aha, well, it's sitting here right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I took that back, you know, back up to, to Warner brothers and um, pitched it. And they, they liked that idea Um, that coincided with, with Joel's uh, interest in this opera singer, who he was a huge, huge, huge fan of, um, to kind of 
uh, be the centerpiece of this party uh, on the deck to start the movie. Uh, and of course the past informs, you know, the present uh, in, in this movie in very sort of interesting and vicious ways. And so we just, you know, we just created this opening that we felt was, you know, really shocking and horrific. And I have to say that Steve Beck uh, really followed through on the execution of it. And I think did a better job with the opening than I was envisioning in my head in terms of the production design, the gore, the bodies sort of the way the body separated and slid, uh, you know, and, and at the same time, giving it sort of this epic, you know, this epic feel um, where it's like, you just can't possibly, this can't be happening, but they're all fucking cut in half. You know, it was just, just so magnificent. So I'm, you know, this, the opening in particular, but ghost ship in general is just one of those projects where, um, you know, driven by, you know, one person saying it must be, it must be better. It must be really good. You know, that's what kind of uh, drove that opening and then drove, you know, the rest of the movie, which I think, um, you know, especially given the budget, Steve Beck, um, uh, you know, the production design, it was shot in Queensland, Australia, mm -hmm. just every, everything that they did uh, with that movie, the performances, Margulies, like I, I just, you know, I just, I just love the movie. And I think ultimately, um, you know, it was about having a lot of sort of fun. And so when you say comfort, like, you know, to, to have that kind of fun, I think can be, can be comforting. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so, I'm so thrilled to see, to see your tattoo. And it's, it's, um, Actually, before I say what I was going to say first, there was something I was thinking about there when you explained the whole opening scene. And I think uh, anybody who likes horror in any capacity, even if you haven't seen the entire movie, definitely knows that opening scene. So you, you're you responsible basically for what 99.9% .9 of the horror community consider as the best kill scene and best opening for any horror movie ever. <laughs> well, it's thank you, but it's you know it's a it's it's a collaboration, uh, and like I said, if if Steve hadn't executed it in the act, you know, but but I'll 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 take I'll I'll take I'll take that credit. Thank you, uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, I actually think if I'm not if I'm not wrong, uh, this October is the twentieth anniversary. I think of Ghost Ship. Is it that? That's 2002, seemed, right? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's this October is the 20th anniversary. How does that, um, I guess, feel for you, uh, you know, 20 years on, like that something that you conceived in your head is still being talked about? And I think in some ways more so than it probably was 20 years ago. Well, that's, I think that's the, in, the interesting part is that it kind of, it, it lives, it lives on in a, in a different way, in an unexpected way. Um, I mean, at, you know, this is, this may sound a little cliche, but, um, you know, my view is that projects and movies are, for me at least, a bit like children. And so when Ghost Ship was born, it, it started growing in one way and then it kind of uh, changed and blossomed and became sort of something else now. Um, and um, the thing that's consistent is, is that, you know, those of us that, that tried to make it, like we put everything we had, our, our, you know, our love, our desire to entertain into the movie. Um, and it's, it's, it's very, um, it's certainly, it's certainly very gratifying. It's also incredibly unexpected um, because you just don't know, um, especially within a year or two of making these things, you don't know what kind of impact they're going to have or if people are going to love them or hate them. I mean, I've had 
all kinds of things done that I thought were the best things in the world and people thought they sucked. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's, um, uh, it's really, it's, it's really, it's really wonderful. Um, uh, when people can, you know, get something out of the movie so many years on. Um, and it's always very, it's always kind of, it's generally pretty unexpected. I think with that opening, because of its notoriety over the years, like it's, it's something I've grown to expect a little bit, whereas sometimes you, people like something that you, that you weren't kind of expecting, but it's a really, you know, it's a really good, it's a really good feeling. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks for asking. And uh, so from that point then, um, uh, like at the time was, was it considered a hit? Like, I think, you know, us as fans and the audience look at it now and think that it was always this thing that like every horror fan talked about at the time, was it seen like that afterwards or was it just kind of like a blip on the map of everything that came out? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so 13, so 13 ghosts, um, was considered, um, a hit, Mm -hmm. um, both creatively and financially, which kind of propelled their, uh, ghost ship. And when ghost ship came out, uh, there was a massive premiere and high expectations for the movie. So, you know, it was like one, it was supposed to be kind of one hit following another. Um, and the production itself and some of the personalities involved, uh, it was, it was quite a, a battle, a war. Um, and, um, uh, was a difficult movie to ultimately get, get made. Um, and when it came out at the premiere, uh, people went fucking crazy. Like in the, I mean, in that opening sequence, I, I mean, there was, sc- there were screams. People left the theater. Somebody threw up. Um, somebody got mad and left. There were, you know, like fist fights and arguments. And this is amongst, you know, pretty normally yeah. not such not such animated, not such an animated group, but, but the, after the premiere, we, we, we all looked at each other and we're like, holy shit, this movie's much better than we thought it was. And we were so, we, meaning I, and, and, you know, some of the others involved, certainly Joel, um, we're like, this is, this is just, you know, this is going to kill at the box office. And you know what? It, it, it didn't, it, it didn't kill at the box office. I can't remember exactly why it, I think it did fine. And Warner brothers was like, yeah, pretty, pretty good. Uh, and then they said, well, let's talk about ghost ship two. Um, and I was like, yes, let's talk, let's, let's do it. And I think, um, uh, the part, the, 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 the creative group that did, the original ghost ship had some issues in terms of coalescing for the second one. In addition, I think it didn't perform through the roof like the expectations were. So it was like, you know, it did well, but they were expecting gigantic numbers and it Mm -hmm. didn't hit gigantic numbers. And then they said, well, let's talk about number two and some deal things and some personnel changes at the studio kind of happened and things just sort of dissipated. And I think ultimately at the time it was considered average, not a hit average creatively fine. Um, And then everyone went on, well, most everyone went on to do other things. Um, And you, you can sort of do the research, but you can see that certain elements, you know, lost their deal and, and, the whole kind of group that put the first one together sort of just started to um, deteriorate. And uh, when executives and producers and they all start to sort of be pulled in different directions or lose, you know, deals or jobs, the enthusiasm goes away and it just sort of like went into the wind. And occasionally I'll run into people that were involved and they'll say, well, whatever happened to ghost ship too. And I'm like, 
it just it just died a slow death. It just it just drifted away. Because now looking back, uh, that to me seems crazy, and I always see it, and it, it's a rumor that floats around there all the time. I, I often see people on Reddit and different places disputing whether um, Ghost Ship Two was like a real conversation or it was just the audience well wishing something into existence and uh, but even still like i said 20 years on the amount of times i see people you know like i wish we could get like a, a prequel a sequel a requel a reboot or this or that do you think that that may ever be a possibility that we would ever see it hell yes and 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 the thing is though the only way that happens is if warner brothers hears from the fans hey what the fuck? It's time for another one. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I just, I've done my last two movies with them. So, like, um, certainly bringing, you know, bringing the creative elements together to make this happen for me is a no-brainer. But, you know, so many things have to happen that, that sometimes the general world doesn't, really know about or maybe understand correctly like the rights situation has to be favorable i don't know i'm assuming warners has the the rights but maybe joel still has them i don't like these are things that for a serious conversation to happen have to be investigated often people people say hey let's do you know, number, let's do a sequel, let's do a prequel, let's do a remake, and the right the rights are fucked up. So um, I don't know what the disposition of the rights, was, was that Village Roadshow? Uh, uh, I think so. Could have been. I don't have it, in, I don't have my, uh, anyway, so so if if Warner starts to hear, there's people want to do this amazing. I mean, I, I, frankly, I always thought that this boat could float forever and be visited by mm -hmm. numerous different groups with their own dynamics. Um, like this is just an idea that can, that, you know, that can go on. Um, and, and I'm person, you know, I've always been excited by it, but it's just never, it's something that's never gotten traction, you know, in my world. And I don't hear the Warner executives going, Hey, you know, what about ghost ship? But I think they should. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. And it was actually, you were right. It's village road show. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's another. So if people were, uh, although village road show and Warners are having their issues with matrix, um, but, you know, Village Roadshow makes a lot of movies and they'd, they'd be another entity to, you know, that fans could could con connect with and say, hey, you know, go ship two, baby, let's go. Yeah, because I mean, I, I think especially now 20 years on, um, you know, I can understand, like you said, there's a lot of moving parts that, you know, we as the audience don't really get to see or know about that all have to come together before this thing could actually be serious but i feel like i mean you know even when you see you know netflix are releasing a, a texas chainsaw movie next week yeah. and things like that i mean I, I at this point i think the fans of ghost ship would take you know this movie on the back of a stamp if <laughs> you know if they could get it um and i think that says a lot about the quality of the work and the passion that was put into it i mean mm. that a movie that I guess you could say 20 years is a long time ago, but I think in the scheme of movies, it's not really. And the fact that there's constant conversation about, you know, give me a remake, even I'll, I'll even take a remake if it means we get like the ghost ship world again. Um, I think it says a lot for what you guys were able to do. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks so much. That, that means, that means a lot. Um, and, um, uh, Anything that I can do to help push that forward, you know, I'm here because uh, I think, like I said, I think there are a lot of opportunities for that story to expand mm -hmm. and ripple and kind of the basic 
horror terror conceits that were used in that movie to be um, expanded upon, you know, is, is, is limitless. And especially in the world of streaming, um, you know, this, it just, it's, it's people, people need, need good stories. And I think that the, the bottom line for me was, I mean, you said comforting. It was, it's, there's a lot of fun and a lot of mischief to be had on that boat. And, um, I feel like a lot of our contemporary movies maybe just aren't tapping into that sense of play, fun, adventure, um, that that movie tapped into. So, um, I'm on board for the ride. Take me with you. That, that's always something that I bring up about. Uh, there's there's a certain magic movies like that have that I don't think has been replicated in a long, long time. Um, so what, what Ghost Ship comes out, and like you said, it's kind of, I guess, not seen as a huge box no. office success. It's kind of average, yeah. but they're kind of happy, and then they're kind of talking about a sequel. And then years later you get in the director's chair. What what was the, for you, what was the, I guess, the crossover between, you know, you're kind of behind the page and now you want to be, I, I guess you write the story and then you're like, you know what, I want to I wanna get in there and kind of make my mark on it as well. Yeah, I mean, um, when I start to get boring, stop me, but um, basically uh, writers, you know, writers all have the same gripes, which is the directors don't do a good job with their work. <laughs> I mean, it's every, every single writer. Yeah. And, and um, because, you know, we think we could do better. We think the decisions mm-hmm. were made that weren't correct and I was no different. And so um, for years I was bitching and moaning um, number one about like what, what happens to my scripts, then other writers are often hired to come in and get rid of what you thought was your best work. And then actors change it. And then the studio cuts it. And so you're sort of, you're, you're at the mercy of this meat grinder. And if you're fortunate, you're very well paid for it. Um, But you, you know, you're, you're, the buck doesn't stop with you. You're the last person the buck stops with, and you, and you start to not even respect yourself because you're like, well, everybody's taking a shot at me and I'm not taking a shot back at mm-hmm. fucking them. And what am I doing here? Um, and so s- perhaps stupidly, but somewhat at the height, if you can call it that, cause I've had many ups and downs as a studio writer. Um, I decided, okay. Um, I, need to shut the fuck up and start directing my own stuff and stop, you know, stop all this, um, you know, mindsing about, Mm -hmm. about other people, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's gotta be me. And so, like I, I said, um, when I wrote the skulls, I intended to direct it. And, um, uh, the some of the creative elements the actors were not available on the right timeline for a first time director so when we got the movie green lit um we we were very fortunate in that that we you know that we had the cast that we did but one of them only had a month window uh, which meant uh almost less than a month of prep and um uh, the producers said to me, and I was one of the producers, so I guess I said it to myself, John, for first time director doing this high profile a movie, because it was for Universal and it was, yeah. you know, a decent budget. Um, and, uh, you know, Josh Jackson, Paul Walker, like good young cast. John, you don't have enough time to prep this movie with no experience that you have. Mm-hmm. And you know what? They were right. Um, but I still regret it. Uh, and so I said, uh, well, who have you got in mind? And we were very fortunate that, that Rob Cohen, uh, who had just finished Rat Pack and was sort of on a, uh, part of a a career ascent, um, was, was interested in doing skulls. I met with him and Rob very generously said, I know this is a big blow for you, John, 
to not direct because you wrote it to direct, but um, you're producing it and why don't you direct the second unit and you'll get a lot of the experience that maybe you will like having in the future, i.e. getting to direct the action, se- some of the action sequences and picking, you know, pickups and everything that Rob didn't have time to do. And he was very, very generous about bringing me into his process um, and sort of giving me some training wheels as the director. And so I was like, you know what, this is, this is the best of all worlds because if I had said no, we may not have gotten the cast. Um, so I said, okay, I said, yes, I want direct. Let's have Rob direct. We got our cast. We got the movie going. I got to direct the second unit where I learned a lot, a lot, a lot. And I have a lot to learn and still do by the way. Um, and I also got to produce the movie. Um, interestingly enough, the, the script in the movie took a direction that I wasn't expecting, which is, became more of a, um, I wrote it more kind of like serious, like dead poet society. Mm-hmm. And it became more of this sort of uh, adolescent wish fulfillment in a way. Um, and, and kind of a little more sort of stylized and, and hyper real. Um, and I think that in retrospect, that was the right way to go with the movie. Um, and it's why it became so successful, but it wasn't my vision of my script. And so I was caught in this sort of um, what's good for the movie, what's good for me, you know, uh, back and forth the whole time. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm happy with the movie and its success and the fact that they made two more and it became, you know, a launching, you know, p- part of a launching pad for careers. But I also, it also kind of put a, uh, 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 the brakes on my directing for, for, for a while because the right project just didn't come by, come along. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I got busy, you know, writing other scripts again, blah, 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 excuses, excuses until I, I just got like, I, I was so, you know, ready to direct my first thing, but I didn't have that perfect product. And uh, Brad left stage six, Steve Bursch, Sony came to me and they said, John, you know, we know that you're probably not interested in this because it's a sequel. It's a number two, but did you like the movie wreck? And I said, I love the movie wreck. It's one of my favorite movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought they did a really great job. The Dowdles with quarantine you know, the, the English language remake, uh, what do you have in mind? And they said, well, we want to do a low budget studio sequel to quarantine. Uh, and I said, I'm, I'm in, I'm interested. Um, and when that happens, the unwritten, uh, understanding is that you basically come in and do it for scale, you know, as cheaply as possible, because this is your opportunity to direct. And so for them, economically, there's a real incentive to getting somebody that's starting at the bottom. Um, so that was, that was what was in it for them. For me, what was in it was to do a sequel to a movie that I really, really liked. The catch was it was super low budget at 3 million. Like you just can't do, you just physically can't do a lot of things that you wish you could do to, especially to do a movie like that justice. And so we had to, um, we had to be very circumspect with our budget and with our concept and ideas um, in order to kind of pull that off. But that's how I got, that's how I got involved in, in quarantine too. And looking back on that now, um, you know, how do you feel about the whole experience? And because again, that's another one of those movies where, um, yes, it's a sequel and whatever, but you know, the, these years on now, I think a lot of people look back on that fondly and it has its own little cult following. It's another one of those movies that I always see kind of brought up every now and again. And there's these like huge discussions about it and, you know, people love it. Some people, oh, I wish they had it on this. I wish we had seen more of that. Um, but for you personally, looking back on that now, you know, how do you feel about the whole, the whole experience? Um, it was a 
Sorry, something's happening to my computer. Um, I have incredible fondness and gratitude for that experience, especially as my first movie, I think, um, at directing. I think that the genre, um, the, the amount of uh, fun that's to be had um, in those contained environments with the mythology that was started with rec and then quarantine. Um, you know, it just, it, I had such a cornucopia of elements to work with that were so exciting and fun. Um, and I think, um, I, you know, I look back on that whole experience like emotionally as, um, and I was, always singing that song it's i think it's a sade song it's never as good as the first time maybe you know that song it's never as good as the first time <laughs> and and that's you know that's kind of how i felt i was just like on a on a cloud the whole time that's that's not to say it wasn't incredibly challenging and that there weren't a lot of things that i fucked up and i could have done better um but i think that um uh, the, the, you know, Mercedes and the cast, Josh, the cast that we had, uh, but the, the fun that we were able to have with that concept on a super low budget, um, there was just sort of a, a, a joy, a joy to the whole, the whole experience. And also, um, I just realized how stupidly ambitious I was and, and still am, but particularly with that movie, for example, you know, not having a lot of experience as a director, I thought, okay, God damn it. If this, you know, first of all, the whole idea was that we wanted something contained and that's why we did it. You know, we kept the constrained point of view from the original two uh, where you're always in this inside and you're never outside the quarantine space. Um, so that was incredibly challenging especially on a budget, but, but also helpful for the budget because we knew we could never be outside. So we knew that we always had to be contained. But I was like, well, for shooting in an airplane, we need to shoot in a real airplane, not some fucking stage bullshit. Mm -hmm. and, and the producers were kind of like, okay, hmm, interesting. Um, and so, you know, Hannah Beachler, who went on to be Oscar nominated, for Black Panther, she was my production designer on that movie. And she's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll find a plane. And so we, we actually found uh, the exact correct commuter jet plane, but in boxes and hundreds of boxes. And so I'm like, well, let's just, you know, let's, we'll just put them together, <laughs> just put them together and, you know, and put them you know, put, put them together in pieces sectionally so we can take them apart and roll them around and then put them back together and shoot, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So we did, we, they put the plane together. Um, but it was so hot in Georgia that summer that the glue and the fastenings for the plane just like melted the entire time while shooting. So we're basically shooting in this large cockpit interior as the plane was sort of collapsing all around us. Um, so uh, it, you know, my high minded ambitions came back and caught us in the ass, uh, in, you know, in many ways in terms of having to cut short scenes, et cetera. Um, but, you know, having the, we, we actually built that plane inside a, a towel factory and the towel factory is the terminal um, and this was before Atlanta, this was right as Atlanta was be becoming the, the, the hub that it was. Mm -hmm. And so this towel factory in this small town outside uh, Atlanta had been undiscovered. And then it sort of turned into, you know, uh, turned into you know, the busiest filming hub in the world. And this towel factory has now been used a thousand times. Mm -hmm. But at the time... It was just it was just there, um, and it had all the the uh, machinery um, that a that a airplane uh, airport terminal had in terms of the the um, 
the the you know moving cargo belts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so when we found it, you know, and, and we were just like everything was like a discovery and joy, and it just sort of all came came into place. And I didn't know any better. We just shot an incredible, incredibly blistering schedule, um, and having a cast that were, you know, for the most part, relative unknowns who were so game and had so much at stake at making this a good movie was just, you know, was just a joy. So I, I, I had a ball, a great crew, a great, great, great cast. And, um, there are a lot of things that I would have done differently, but, um, you know, we just, we put everything that we could in, you know, into the movie and, uh, I, you know, I have great memories from it. And um, I'm not sure what it was like in the States, but I know that over here and in the UK, around the time that movie was due out, there was actually a lot of, obviously relative to the size of the countries, there was this huge buzz within like the movie um, communities, I guess, about that coming out. And and I've often seen people um, talk about that movie in a, a really nice light about the mm-hmm. fact that you know, it wasn't just a remake of Wreck 2. Um, a lot of people reckon that it's better than the first quarantine. Um, mm. I've seen that. Um, again, like it, it seems, and this ties into actually a listener question that I had. Um, it, it seems that you've time and time again kind of had your finger on the pulse, I guess you could say. And someone wrote in uh, and asked... Uh, John, you've made some of my, or been involved with some of my favorite movies from U.S. Marshals to Ghost Ship to Quiet Ones and more. How come we haven't seen more from you? Hmm. That's, uh, first of all, a a great compliment. And, um, uh, and a very good question. And I think a, a, an accurate question accurate meaning uh something that i struggle with because it's very um it's hard to get it's hard to get a movie made Uh, so you know more from me i mean i've done five movies and you know six credits but it probably could be 30 in Mm -hmm. my own head um, and I certainly curse, curse every moment that I'm not able to be making them. Uh, and I told you my, my, uh, you know, my, my malaise, my darkness when I'm not creating and making it's, it really hurts. And so I think that's, that's a, it's an excellent question, um, that I, I'm, I'm going to struggle to answer a little bit because it's not out of. Um, it's not like I had a nervous breakdown and have a great excuse, you know, and, and had to take a year off between projects. Um, uh, so I don't really, I don't have an excuse. Um, I've, I've written, so when I'm not directing, I'm always writing something and, and as a writer, I'm going to fall back on the excuse that led me into directing, which is um, I have a lot of projects that have never gotten made that I consider mm-hmm. to be my best scripts. Um, and um, so I'll direct a movie and then not have the next one lined up and be like, fuck, yeah. where's the next thing? Well, okay, I'll go write something. And then that'll be six, four, six months um, and maybe do two things at once. And then six months goes by and then, Oh, here's the next thing. And that's another six months. So I think the answer to that question is one. Uh, I just haven't always had the opportunities that I wish that I had had Two, as also a writer and a director, because I'm always writing things, I tend to get caught up in those writing things and that takes a lot of time and it pushes the directing projects back. But three, I would say, you know, um, uh, my directing projects haven't all been, you know, haven't, or many haven't been 
giant commercial successes. And so what happens is that um, I'm not at the level where I have two, three projects in the pipeline that are greenlit and ready to go like many of my uh, peers or elders or youngers that have like, oh, well, what's his next project? Oh, they'll fund that. I'm just not at that level yet for, for whatever, for many reasons. And so it takes me time to find the right project, get involved, um, often rewrite the project. Uh, it's just, it's time. And so um, that's a very long winded, hopefully honest way of answering that question um, which is a complex, a complex one. And it, and it, and it hurts too, because you know what? I, I often go, you know, fuck, I, I should be doing two, three movies a year. The, but the fact of the matter is, I don't know if I, if I physically could, because, you know, like the movie that, that I just did, Physically, it's it's like a, you know, a marathon every day for, you know, it's 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 very, very demanding. Um, but that sounds like an excuse. And maybe it is. I think I just, you know, you have to take all of those answers and kind of roll them up in a ball with a grain of salt. Um, and and I think the bottom line is I just haven't had the opportunities that I wish I had. Yeah, and I, I actually really appreciate your honesty about that because I think as an audience, you know, we we see these things crop up and like, um, you know, the Skulls has cult following, Ghost Ship has cult following, Quarantine 2 has uh, cult following, uh, you directed Deep Lucy 3, that's had a baked in cult following before that and then even more so now. The mm. quiet ones, in my personal opinion, um, is one of the better um, horror movies. I know some people don't refer to it as that. They have some other like psychological whatever mm-hmm. that has come out in the last 20 years. And I suppose from a, a fan standpoint, I think probably what he's alluding to is like, you know, why don't we, <laughs> let's keep doing this. Is it frustrating yeah. for you, I guess, to have people probably constantly saying that to you and then also maybe going from having that conversation to maybe sitting in a boardroom or sitting with executives going are you fucking dumb like do you not understand that these people like there's still 20 years later and people are still talking to me about this scene i wrote in a movie 22 years ago like that's <laughs> that's a that's a great it's a great question i mean uh Here's the here's the thing. It, there's not there's nothing more gratifying to me than talking to. Um, I don't want to use the word uh, man on the street or fans mm-hmm. or non industry people, but I mean movie lovers. Yeah, people that like stories. That there's there's nothing that I like better than that, and more gratifying than hearing that somebody connected with something that I did, even if it's just the beginning of ghost ship and they hated the rest, like fantastic. You know, we all have different, different tastes and that's, that's why there should be so many different kinds, different kinds of movies. So, you know, I, I love that. And I, and I, I'd much rather talk, you know, to you than, you know, some of, some of my, uh, well, you know, <laughs> contemporaries know here. What like, you're going to say? <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, in the arena that I've chosen to dip my feet in, which is Hollywood, um, the cliche that you're only as good or as hot as your last movie is absolutely true. Nobody, no executive, seems to give two shits about whether anybody liked anything that I've ever done in the past. Nothing. Zero. Yeah. It is, it is, it is, you know, what's his last movie? Deep Blue C3. Oh, I heard that was good. Probably didn't take the time to go watch it. Um, mm. 
doesn't really want to know my reasons for doing that movie, which some people scratch their heads about. Um, how did it do? Well, it's, it's streaming. We don't know, but it's got, you know, 16,000 reviews on Amazon. Well, that's unusual. Yeah. So maybe it's doing well, but they, they don't, they don't give a shit. They don't, they don't care, you know, and, and uh, not to sort of, you know, take a shit on the people that I work with generally, but th- that's just, that's just the operating principle is how much money, how, how well is it done? You know um, now there are exceptions in terms of executives uh, and there and, and companies. And, you know, I love Warner brothers and I, and there, there are people there like, you know, Brad Luff, Jeff Brown, et cetera, that, that, that kind of get me and value, value me. Um, uh, and there, there are people at other studios and other companies, you know, and we're always looking, mm-hmm. but for me, I have to find something that is going to, you know, when I'm looking, I have to find like the next baby, my next child. Yeah. Like it's not, I'm not doing it for the fucking money. You know, God knows I don't need the money. Like I need the story. I need, I need the movie that's 20 years from now. We're going to still be talking about. Those are hard. Those are hard to find. And when you write the scripts, they're really hard to get made. Like I, you know, I, I, I've got a, I got, I got to tell your, tell your fan, like if I've got a shelf of scripts that I think are the the best thing since sliced bread, people, people aren't that interested in them too weird. You know, that's, that's a weird idea that there's just, you know, there's a, a limited, there's a limited range that people are interested in in my world. And now I could go outside my world and spend a lot more time trying to raise money and do things independently. So, you know, Mm -hmm. so don't cry for me, but, but it, it's, 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 it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to, to get stuff made. Do you think there's a window for, and I, and I hear this a lot of times from creatives and people who are like really passionate and driven about their work and their visions. Do you think that there's an avenue that can be created for that like separate from i guess the huge like hollywood mainstream machine is there something that can be maybe built over here where people can actually explore that creativity and and not be kind of smashed into if they do get a project greenlit smashed into like well yeah no i get it and i get it's your vision your baby and whatever but also i just want you to put in some other shit that doesn't make sense and well, people seem to like TikTok now, so you've got to put TikTok in it and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Is there a way to create a, a zone, I guess, for people to be safe, to be able to actually create? That is, that is a, a fantastic, fantastic question. And I, 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 I don't, first of all, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I have an opinion that, you may not like, which is that um, the process, the oftentimes, if there isn't a sort of trial by fire process for the idea for where the money comes from, mm-hmm. etc., then things could fall into the realm of indulgence. And you start to make movies that are maybe not for your viewers, but are more for yourself. And like it or not, the marketplace uh, can sometimes put a, uh, it has to rise to this level type edict on a project. Um, But then the flip side of it is, you start making stories for that process and not for what could be what you're describing. So, so I don't, I don't know. I think that the, the really good news continues to be that you can every year, it can cost less and less to make a movie. You know, you can shoot it on your iPhone. Um, So 
the excuse for going into the world that you're describing, the bar monetarily continues to go lower. And so I actually think that already exists. Mm -hmm. You just have to raise $10,000, your iPhone, get good actors and a great story and go do it. Um, And the problem is how do you get those seen? Like that's, that's, that's the part. That's the part where the two, the different realms, at least in this realm, because it's gone through the process, it has a home or it may have a home. Some don't where it can be seen, but how do you, how -hmm. do you get those sort of more, the projects that you're describing to be, to be seen. And then that becomes another, should we go away from this and start this? So my, my answer is my first answer, which is, I don't, I don't know, but I think it should continue to be, you know, explored um, uh, because the current, you know, the, the current system I don't think is working super well from my point of view in terms of, are we making better movies and telling better stories? There certainly is a lot more content. Yeah. That is undeniable. There's a lot more content and I'll, and I'll leave the speechifying at that. And you're definitely, and I think that's across the board, um, not just from what you do, but even on a way smaller, lesser scale, like say something like this, uh, you know, a podcast can be a great way but again it's it's one of those things where um you know organically let's say this has grown to a couple of thousand listeners per episode Mm, and then it's like how do you like i can i i can have steven spielberg on tomorrow but if nobody knows that i'm talking to steven spielberg comes the issue and 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 i get what you mean about the same thing with these movies it's like well how do i you know there's so much content. There's so much stuff going on. It's like how do, how do you push the project out there? Um, yeah. if you look through, I have a final few questions for you before I let you go. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, you have a wide array of genres. I guess it would seem under your belt. What would you attribute that to? Is it your curiosity and passion for movies, or you know, like you've gone from things like Ghost Ship and U.S. Marshals and Deep Blue Sea Tree, there's, there's a lot of different types of movies. Is that you, just your personal curiosity or is it just the way things kind of played out? Um, well, I think the question is a compliment and I appreciate that. Um, you know, for me, uh, like I said, in order to break into the business, I sort of zeroed in on a particular arenas, genre, whatever you want to call a techno thriller, and then sort of expanded from there. Um, I personally like a wide variety of stories um, and um, am not kind of one of those people that um, is kind of happy, satisfying, and sort of staying in one lane some people might argue, well, John, you should stay in one lane and be better at that, you know, at driving in that lane and not go mm-hmm. into so many different lanes. But um, I, you know, I think it is, it's, it's a love of different kinds of stories and a curiosity about, well, what would it be like to shoot this kind of a movie? I think that that's why, and part of, part of the answer to your question is why I've done some of the last movies that I have, which is their, um, I would say they're multi, multi genre mashups in a way. Um, certainly deep blue C three, um, took its cues or attempted to, uh, and I'm being pretty high and mighty by saying that from the first deep blue C, which was a multi genre, you know, mm-hmm. it had it had sci-fi, it had environmental concerns, it was a horror movie, it was, you know, it, it, it combined so many things. Yeah. And so um, I like exploring uh, and and the challenge of trying to go into those 
different realms and arenas. Um, uh, and I think that, that, that horror or whatever, however you want to define it is, uh, a very broad lane. And so you can pull in all those other genre story elements into whatever horror means and tell a story. Um, and because of its breadth, that's, that's something I really, I really, you know, love about horror, but with, you know, for example, the, the last piece that I did, um, Eraser Reborn, Mm -hmm. um, is, is a, um, takes the Schwarzenegger character from the 95, 96 version in a new direction, uh, because this is a character that, um, that dealt with erasing people's identities and then starting over. And I think in 20 years, that's become with the digital era, social media, et cetera, a much more challenging thing to do. And also sort of dictates a different tone and a different kind of concept of what that movie could be. But again, that's, that's, you know, the, the original eraser was, had a sci-fi element. It had a, uh, a corporate, you know, the, 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 the military, uh, corporate industrial complex issues kind of arose. It had the rail guns, it had animals, it had horror elements, it had huge action. So um, I think that's the natural progression, you know, for me. Um, That said, um, I really, really like well, well done movies that do stay in the lane that, Mm -hmm. you know, that elevate me, Uh, you know, hereditary, the orphanage, Um, you know, so um, I don't know what's, what's next, but I'm going to, if I can sort of continue to kind of explore those avenues in in maybe other genres or maybe continue to do what I'm, what I've been doing. I'm not sure. And I feel like um, when you mention things like Hereditary, uh, you know, Midsummer is another one that comes to mind, The Orphanage, and there's a couple of others. And I feel like, um, don't have to get into it too much, but I feel like The Quiet Ones is another one of those ones, for me personally anyway, that slips into those kind of categories. And I'm I'm glad to see it lately has been kind of starting to garner its audience again. I feel like that's mm-hmm. one that um, slipped through the cracks a little bit, which is... Um, it's a, no. it's a little bit annoying from from my point of view. Like I see a lot of love out there from time to time for it, but I just feel like that that's one that slipped through the cracks. That could have been, I don't know. It really like I think back to something like The Conjuring, and it like kind of has that feel in the sense of like if this just had a hit at the right moment, or I don't know how you say it in the right way, or if it had just yeah. been taken, that it could have became this huge thing. Yeah. Th- thank you. Thank you. That's, you know, uh, an incredible compliment. Um, I mean, the, that's a, that's a tricky one because I do sort of scratch, you know, scratch this head and go, God damn it. Why mm-hmm. didn't that do gangbuster business? Um, and I'm not exactly sure I or anyone really knows the answer, I certainly have like, like logical things that I could, that I could tell you, but, um, you know, with that cast, you know, Olivia Cook, Sam, um, you know, the, the, the whole, why, why that didn't burst through, um, is a, is a mist is a mystery to me. Cause I, 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 you know, I love the movie. I love what it was about. It had a great pedigree, um, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that other than, uh, from a storytelling perspective, um, in the, how could I have made it better department? If we're being frank, the ending, the ending to quiet ones, um, w- we had a more, I think, emotionally satisfying, shocking ending, Mm-hmm. that we were not able to pull off from a visual perspective, visual effects perspective. 
And I feel like if I'm trying to rationalize and understand for myself why the movie wasn't a blockbuster hit, I mean, it, 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 it made money. We made it for $3 million. So like it's, it's made, it's made plenty of money, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it wasn't perceived as a, as a hit. And I think rightly so. Um, But we had an ending, we had an ending um, where uh, Olivia Cook's character, um, we see the entity that she's been conjuring in her head and she embraces it like a mother. Um, and, uh, in doing so kills herself. And we were not able to figure out how to do that. And the visual effects company that was our partner essentially went out of business because we, we couldn't figure it out. And so we went for what I feel like is a more of a genre scare with, mm-hmm. the, with, with Evie at the end, instead of what was a much more sort of, um, I don't want to use the, it was just more emotionally and satisfying and scary and spectacle yeah. than we had. And I always wonder if the end had been more satisfying and more payoff would the movie have done better? I don't know. Every time I have this conversation with people, they think it wouldn't have mattered, but that is, you know, that is something that as a filmmaker, it's like, you know, it's always about the end. It's always about the end, you know? And so like with deep blue C three, the whole movie was about, was about that, that ending. And that's Mm -hmm. true of Eraser as well. And I feel like that's maybe something that I learned or, or had to learn from quiet ones. Cause in my head, that's why it didn't explode the way that it should have. Cause it should have, cause we had the talent, you know, we, we had all the elements, um, you know, lot, there were all sorts of issues with how the movie was released. The release date was changed. A horror movie was moved in front of us that we didn't counter the marketing campaign Mm -hmm. all sorts of other things that I don't know if those are real reasons or excuses, but you know, there are a lot of things that sort of played into this, but I, I I do think that it had more, you know, more potential uh, and it is, it is a head scratcher. Yeah. That's definitely one. Go on about that. No, but that, (laughs) and it's, it's a, it's, I don't want to say nice to hear you have the same feeling because I guess, it would be better if you just weren't in that position at all. But I definitely do feel like that that's one that just, it it could have been so much bigger, but for some reason it just didn't get through the cracks or it didn't seem to, like I see people even now, like up until like a couple of weeks ago, you know, I would often see people post on Instagram or wherever it might be. I just checked out this movie for the first time and I'm like, it like blows my mind that, how has this like not been on the radar yeah. more often and a lot longer? Well, it's, it's a great question. It also goes to your audience, your audience, your viewer, your listeners question, which is like, why not more? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, sometimes you just don't. Yeah. It's just, sometimes you just don't know. And, and uh, you know, I can come up with reasons, but I don't know if those are the real reasons. Um, so, I was going to ask you. You seem like quite a a driven, passionate. I can just tell from your your energy and your kind of a, a aliveness, I guess, if you want to call it that, um, <laughs> that you're quite driven and quite passionate. And I guess I, my question would be revolving around you said about you know having ups and downs. Yeah. When, when you end up on on these downs, let's say, um, and I think everyone has them in different in different ways. Without getting, you know, obviously too personal, how do you personally um, keep yourself motivated and, and, and stop those downs from, like, keep going, you know, that you can kind of level yourself back out? Yeah. Do you have anything to kind of, is a passion for what you do that kind of levels you out? Well, first, uh, it's a very, it's a very good, it's a very good question. Um 
First, I, I don't want to deny that there are the downs, right? I don't know. I don't want to say, oh no, you know, I just go from project to project. It's not, it's not like that. It's, it's a not only from a career perspective, but from an emotional perspective, it's a it's a it's a roller coaster ride. Um, so, one, I guess th- these answers don't sound so good to me in my head, but I'm going to give them anyway. One is I'm a pretty generally uh, optimistic mm-hmm. optimistic person. Um, you know, even given my Scottish Irish roots, uh, you can appreciate that. But I, 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 um, I also think that the you know I like to be engaged in the battle and the fight, and and I don't want to give up. And and um, when you've been doing it this long, like you know, the pendulum is going to swing the other way. <laughs> and so you have to have some faith and just kind of hang in there and you can hit really low points and, and be very frustrated. And, you know, I'll, I'll never work again. Um, why weren't these, you know, you can focus on the bad, but I think ultimately we storytellers were given like the most amazing gift, which is the creative process. And so when I am feeling really, low, down, depressed, angry, whatever. It's like, fuck you, John, sit your ass down and, and write. Like you can do that no matter what. That doesn't mean it's, it's going to get made or people are going to like it, but, but you have something that, you know, you're like a bricklayer, a bricklayer can lay, lay a foundation. I can sit and come up with a story, maybe not a great story, but I can still do it. And so like the idea that there's something that I can still do sustain, you know, sustains me. Um, And so the creative process, you know, and the kind of the unknown muse that helps get you through the work is, is all will always come. And often you, I have faith in that and you sit down and maybe for eight hours, it doesn't come, but then you get up, you go to the bathroom and then in the bathroom, it comes Mm -hmm. like, like it, 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 it will come, it will come with, with the work, with hard work. Uh, And, you know, I read, when you read Stephen King's process or, you know, so many people that are so prolific, um, they, you know, they have faith that the muse is going to come to them and that, that they're going to be this conduit for the creative urge instinct, whatever it is. And so I am positive that that will happen, but I'm not so hung up on the end result. Will it get turned into a movie? I don't know. Yeah. I've lived, I, you learn to live with uncertainty. And then I'm also very fortunate in that I have a fantastic support group of family. My wife is, is incredible great friends, um, great kids. So, um, you know, I have really what, what matters. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, how I get through the dark, you know, the darker spots and, you know, we all need those to, to get through in this fucking crazy world. So like, I, I don't have any excuses. I have everything, you know, that I need, but that doesn't mean that I still, you know, get uh i'm still on that roller coaster for Mm -hmm. real yeah yeah um i appreciate the honesty about that and and something that uh you mentioned there about you know you kind of tell yourself you know sit down and and write something or create something is is that your process for writing a story um i guess is it something where you have to be inspired by something you know you're walking down the street and you see something you kind of go okay I've got an idea now I need to jot this down or do you actually Mm -hmm. actively sit down and go, okay, I need a story. Both. Interesting. So I think the, the, the blessing and the curse, the blessing is what I just told you. The curse is that you can't turn it off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And so, so, you know, um, I'll go get a massage and the massage therapist will say, you know, did you get time off from work? And I'll say, no, I'm working right now. You know what I mean? Like you're, yeah. you're always, 
you're always, you know, work isn't the right word. You're always turning, turning for the story. And so even to the point when you're, when you're dreaming, like I keep, you know, a dream journal, like most people, many people. And, and, um, I'll wake up in the morning, write it down and say, is this a movie? Is it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) is it, you know, it's ridiculous. It never, it, it never stops. And that can be, um, a little bit, uh, challenging to live with sometimes because you're always, you know, you're, you're like the actor that's always on, you know, mm-hmm. like, like who, who wants to be the storyteller that's always thinking of stories. But, but, you know, I almost every waking moment is, is this material? Is this a line? Is this a story? When I read books, this, this, this is, this happens all the time. I read a book and I start loving it. And I read the whole thing. and I'm like, fuck, and I call and I get the, and the rights and, and, you know, and, and, uh, this just happened to me yesterday. Uh, I, I finished this book and I'm like, this is, this is amazing. Uh, call and get the rights. And it's like, uh, it just finished production. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's everything, every, you know, it's sometimes hard to balance that with just like reading a book for the sake of reading it and not yeah. just to turn it into something of your own making. Um, so yeah, yeah. And it, 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 it kind of, um, uh, it reminded me of something I was going to ask earlier on the topic of, I guess, naysayers or, um, negativity. And I'm not sure if you've, I assume everybody to some degree has dealt with it. Uh, I find a lot of the listeners, you know, they talk about, um, maybe family members, friends, different people, and they don't even mean to be negative, but it's like that lack of self-awareness about, you know, telling you like, you're not going to be a writer, John, or really, you're not going to direct movies, get a real job or get a life mm-hmm. or whatever. I, I guess a twofold question, have you dealt with that in your life? And how how are you able to navigate that and not let that consume you and just stop you from doing what you loved? It, it, it's a great question. And the answer is every single day um, from, uh, from, from, from every corner. And I think that if you, I think you need to develop a very thick skin, but I think that no matter how thick your skin is, you'll always, you can always get hurt by it. So I don't think there's an antidote to, the pain and the angst that come from naysayers and people that don't have faith in you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that if you want to do what, you know, if you, if you want to be a storyteller and, and, and get movies, you know, get things made, et cetera. um, You need to take all that hating and negativity um, and, um, do a couple things with it, turn it into energy and fuel for you to try harder. Um, or, um, don't do this Yeah. because, because if, 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 if the slings and arrows from friends, family, whoever are going to stop you, you know, that's like, that's, that's the first obstacle that you encounter. There are going to be a hundred obstacles worse than that. After you break through that battle line, trust me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's, it's very constructive to figure out as a human being, how you're going to deal positively and constructively with criticism um, at every level. Uh, and that's changed a lot for me, and I've been fortunate to go through the process. For example, um, as a writer, you write a draft, you turn it in, and you get uh, 30 pages of notes. <laughs> and notes from this whole thing doesn't work to um, – the, the blue bonnet that you have her wearing on page 34 should be red. Why? I'd, I'd rather it be red. So they're arbitrary um, 
they're hurtful, they're global, they're micro, but within that, there are often true and good ideas and criticisms that can make your story better. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have, and you have to develop, and I think it's a process just like a bricklayer, like how do you, how do you make the best mortar? How do you deal with criticism the best? And it's a process and you have to figure it out. Otherwise don't do this, but you have, you have to figure out a process. And part of my process is, and everyone has a different one. If it's going to make the script better, listen to it. Uh, and so um, I hate bad notes and I get tons of them. Sometimes I get good notes and sometimes I get notes that really hurt, but they're correct. Mm-hmm. And they make, they make things better. So I think that you have to have, you have to have an open mind about your own work that, It could, you're not, you know, I'm not somebody that always hits hundred percent all the time. And some, some writers do that. Some writers, their first drafts are Oscar winning movies, like 0.0001% do that, but some do. And so for me, I've learned as much as I hate it, that, that sometimes these criticisms are correct. And as a director, I have a different process because I also get 30 pages of notes, right? (laughs) So as a director, what I do is I say, I try to have the same open mind and I'll get a note and I'll say, this is fucking the worst note I've ever heard. I want to kill this person. And then I'll turn to the editor and say, let's try this. And we'll try it. Like this sequence is too slow. You know, mm-hmm. let's pick up the pace. It's perfect. It's perfect the way it is. Okay, fuck. Let's try it. And maybe we go, we do it, and maybe it is better. But what you have to do is you have to have pure intent when you do that so you're not undermining their note in the process. So you have to really have a direct, uh, editor and that you trust and trust yourself and go, maybe they're right. Fuck, I hate that. I hate when they're right, but let's try it. And you know what? Often, maybe 10% of the time, that improves the movie. Mm -hmm. And you go, that was a great, that was a great note. I hated it, but we tried it. Uh, And I think you you have to try, you have to, you've got to give it a shot in the editorial room. That's why I have an open edit. When I start a movie, I don't do director's cut. Producers can walk in day one. Um, They just have to know that whatever criticism they're giving me up until my director's cut, I'm the boss and I don't have to take their criticism, but I want it because it's going to make my director's cut good. And I'll say, you know what? Your idea sucked. We tried it. Bye. Yeah. But they'll come back and have another idea. Uh, that idea was, was good. That's going to be in the director's cut. Then you've sucked your friends and enemies into the process, but you haven't compromised on your movie. So when you get to your director's cut and you get sort of a chance to start over again, you've already got their notes and you've taken the good ones and you've made it better. And their bad notes, well, you've already killed those. So we get to the director's cuts They're invested. They don't have any notes. So we spend the next month, whatever, not fighting about stupid notes, but making, making the movie better and better and better and better and better. Like that's my process. Some people don't want to do that, but that's my answer to your question in terms of Mm -hmm. how can you, how can you make that product productive? But you know, friends, friends are all, when you say, Oh, I'm going to be a movie director, right. Or whatever. The, the instinct is, I mean, everybody wants to do this. So the instinct is they're going to, it's, it's a biological thing. They're going to try to cut you down sometimes, you know, and it, it's yeah. just, you, you have to, you have to learn whatever your process is. You have to learn to deal with that negativity and use it or get out. 
do something else. And I feel like, um, you know, maybe now we're more in a time where, you know, you talked about there is some people out there whose first movie ends up being an Oscar winning movie and it's this and it's yeah, that. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think in, in the day of social media now, uh, a lot of people... I don't want to say feel entitled to that, but a lot of people don't actually realize that for 99.9% of the people involved in whatever specific area it is, it's just not like that. And it's like you said, it is a struggle. It is a grind. It is a, you know, you've got to get down in the trenches and, and fucking fight. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. No. And, and I don't know if it's, if social media and kind of our world has exacerbated that um, I don't want to use the word instant gratification because it's not instant, but, but um, I think there is, there is a, there's a mythology about our business and our process that is reinforced by the occasional uh, home run story Mm -hmm that is not, not par for the course and is the opposite of truth. And so people's expectations are so out of whack that it, they're so high that it stops what could be a great career, you know, because they don't, I mean, who wants to be told it's going to take six to 10 years for you to learn how to be a good screenwriter? Yeah, yeah. Nobody. I want to take one free course online. I want exactly. Or I wrote stuff already. I mean, so, so it's, you know, it's the world that we live in today that the reality and the, the perception are, they're 10 times crazier out of whack than when I started. Um, and when I started, they were all, it was in, it was in, insane. Um, it was like one in 10,000 writers would make it. Um, and now, you know, uh, it's, it's tough, but I do, I do think there's a lot of opportunity for people that want to learn the craft. Um, and there's some people that are just gifted that are gifted naturally and God bless them. And, and, and I wish I was one of those people, but, but I'm not, um, I think it's just like, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a lifelong process. And like, I'm still, you know, maybe it's good that it's taken me a, a while, like, you know, to your reader's question, like I'm still kind of crawling up that curve, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a fantasy that you can just sort of come out here and that it's going to be easy. And that's too bad because I think, if people's expectations were more realistic, they'd hang in there longer and they'd get better because God damn it. I, I, the writing that I read, like people don't people, a lot of people aren't putting in the bricklayer time to learn how to write correctly and, and well, and, and it's just not, it's, it's, it's just not going to, happen without you know learning and 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 being part of the process and also having a familiarity and a context with stories i read scripts all the time by young writers and i'm like this is this plot is, has been used three times in other movies you know here here they are you didn't you didn't you didn't watch mm-hmm. the well, you didn't watch the original hitcher yeah, like this is this is the you're doing the hitcher again. The you know the flip side of that is cultural memory is so short these days that a lot of executives and stuff haven't either. <laughs> so they'll just do the movie, and it won't matter. But like to me, it does matter. Yeah, and it was something um, I had a conversation with someone last week about this, and they just brought up the fact that. Uh, you know, a lot of times now as well when someone's writing something or whatever, they might see something that seems like, uh, I think you mentioned earlier, like on trend or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they go and write it with that intention of like, oh, that's popular right now or that's hot. But by the time that gets from, you know, point A 
to point Z and it's actually going to be a thing, that's already passed. So there was, you need to write things you're passionate about, things you're interested in, just kind of build your craft up rather than, oh yeah, that John guy I seen that's obviously a big Hollywood guy, he done a thing that was seemed quite popular. I'm just going to do that. Uh, it's an excellent, it's an excellent point. And to ripple on that, um, I don't do a project if I feel like it can't be done in 10 years as well. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, because that's fucking how long it takes often. I mean, it's, it, it takes, you know, it, 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 can take 15, 20 years and people don't want to, you know, they don't want to hear that, but, but it, it has to be a story that, that, um, that works yeah. anytime. Uh, and that's, you know, you can't chase, you can't chase a trend unless you're really, you know, like it follows or like you're, 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 you're really, you've really sort of tapped into something that is really of the moment that is so good and so exciting um, that you've got to do it now. And so there are exceptions to that. Um, yeah. But, you know, but the, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I know exactly. And it, it's something that comes up again and again. Um, do you have, I, I had said earlier about, you know, the likes of Ghost Ship being a, a, a comfort movie for me. And sometimes I think that, uh, maybe comes across as a slight and I don't mean it as in comfort as in like it's trash. I mean, as in it's like a, a safe place for me. It's something that brings me back to a certain time. It makes me feel a certain way. Do you have anything movie wise or book wise or anything like that, that you kind of find yourself revisiting? I would like when I say often, I don't mean every day or every week, but you know, something that you find yourself kind of going back to. Um, for, for sure. Um, the, there are certain, there are certain movies that like, I just can watch them over and over again and get that. Uh, I know what you mean that you don't want to make a value judgment with the word sort of comfort or fun, but, um, basically any Stanley Kubrick movie, Mm -hmm. like I can just, you know, I can just sort of watch them over and over again and um, with a couple exceptions, but just, you know, and just sort of soak up the performances. Yeah. The Shining, I think, you know, is a, is a great, is a great example of that. I mean, at the, the performances, the scares, the feeling that, that it gives me, you know, um, I think Jaws is another, is another one that I, I mean, I've mentioned it over and over again. Um but I really like, you know, there, there's so many movies. I really like for, uh, foreign films. Um, like I just saw Drive My Car. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't. I, I've heard of it, but I haven't. It's, it's, it's going to be one of those movies that I will be able to watch kind of over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Rosemary's Baby. Um, you know, Polanski, Polanski movies, Chinatown, Knife in the Water, like there's just, there's certain, there's certain directors who I just feel like um, they give me so much, uh, I'm going to use the word pleasure instead mm-hmm. of comfort, just like pleasure, yeah. like Apocalypse Now, I can watch Apocalypse Now, uh, you know, forever on, on, a, on a loop, so there, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of books, um, that, that I, you know, like Moby Dick, I can, I can read that, um, you know, uh, every couple of years. And as, as I get older, like it becomes more and more of a hilarious story that when I read it, when I was 12, I thought it was the most serious book I'd ever read. Now I think it's one of the funniest. So, uh, you know, so we're so lucky to have, so you know so many great stories to 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 give ourselves pleasure and sustenance with so like you know that it's it's all it's all out there um going forward um yeah. 
what are your plans, your goals, something like that? Um, is there any any specific? Are you you know are you the kind of person that sits down and and makes out specific goals? Is there anything that you are looking to achieve? Like, I guess from the outside looking in, a lot of people would think, oh, you know, you you've done it all, really. Why don't you just sit back and just chill? Don't worry about it. But then I I also get the the other side. It's like the devil on your shoulder. That's constantly that part of the brain that's switched on and you just want to do it so what is the goal going forward <laughs> well you know that it's funny because you say you've done it all and i, I feel like i've i've you know bar- barely done it so mm-hmm. like that's it's all about perspective um but um look i really uh i really love the the directing you know i love directing and um uh, in terms of what I would like to do next, um, it's very simple. I just want to m- just make a great, a great movie. Um, I'm kind of beyond the point where I really care that much about them being a hit financially. Mm-hmm. I just want it to be a good, you know, a good movie. Uh, and if it's, you know, and, and to get made, um, but, um, you know, I, in terms of, in terms of arenas, um, I think I could answer the question by sort of telling, talking a little bit about what I'm working on maybe, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, I have a, I have a project that, um, uh, is very much in the vein, um, of, of a hereditary, which has to do, uh, with a region where I grew up, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, and in the Chesapeake Bay, it's the home to the blue crab, which people which people eat, and they don't realize that that blue crabs, um, while also being this sort of very scary, strange creatures, sort of insectoid creatures that live under the water like little sharks, but they're actually crabs, um, often have also have this sort of uh, uh, element of immortality to them, in that. If you break off a limb, it will grow back. Um, They shed their skin like snakes, thus soft shell crabs, which are delicious, but they shed their skins. They have very strange mating rituals, um, but they've survived for a millennium um, because of their ability to have this sort of immortal quality to them. And this particular story takes place in Chesapeake Bay. Um, about, about a group of, of people, descendants of slaves, who've managed to harness the immortal qualities of the blue crab in order to get what they want. Um, and so that's a very kind of uh, high-end, if you will, um, sort of atmospheric um, uh, horror movie in the vein of the others, uh, orphanage, mm-hmm. like, like it's sort of a very much of a place. Yeah. Um, I have another project that um, is the good fellows of politics, which basically melds politics and the mob together based on a, on a book that I have the rights to um, that uh, we have a big, big actor wants to do. And so that's kind of all coming together. Um, but that's a completely different, different arena. That's a very sort of good fellas, Scorsese S character driven piece uh, that kind of lays bare the fact that we all know, which is money is at the root of politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, then um, I have another project that's uh, uh, that's a contained um, thriller uh, female driven that takes place on a super yacht. Um, and, uh, the, I don't know if you know, but like the whole, the whole, uh, the world of super yachts is, you know, and the, and the intrigue of the crew and how they interact with, with the the people that own them in this world of one percenters is kind of very relevant. And this is kind of a thriller that takes place, you know, on a super yacht. So, I could go on, but like they're all incredibly varied and different and not mm-hmm. very sp- specific. 
Um, you know, I'm going to be involved uh, probably with Deep Blue Sea 4 um, uh, in some capacity. Uh, that's under development now. Um, and so that's scheduled to get going soon, hopefully. Um, and with um, the next iteration of Eraser, uh, because we think, you know, we think that's a big ongoing franchise. You'll see when you see the movie, mm -hmm. each one takes place in a different, uh, unique city. Um, and so, um, you know, be sort of shepherding both of those franchises as they move forward. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see what else, um, uh, we'll see what else is out there, but if it's a great, great story, um, that has potential to grow up and be a, an interesting kid, then I'm in. Uh, I have two final things I, I want to ask you before yeah. I let you go. And it was just something that you'd done there that kind of added uh, one extra little thing that I wanted to ask. Sure. Uh, I, I, you know, as, as a filmmaker, as a writer, as a director, as a producer, you, you have to wear all these different hats. Yeah. How important would you say... And maybe you didn't even realize, but what you done right there, where you explained that first project, how important is it to somebody to be able to do what you just done there? Because um, I feel like just from your your simple explanation of the story, you got me straight away. I made a note, Google. I want to look up this bay. I want to find out about this. I want to. Yes. How important is that? Um, and is it? Do you think it's overlooked? you know, from a, from a creative, from a writer standpoint to actually be able to pitch and make a person like, you know, you can turn something that if I were to just say that to you, it would probably just seem like, yeah, it's a thing with, with like a crab thing and a, a place where I, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? How important is that to actually be able to, to make it exciting, you know, I guess speak the vision you see into existence. Yeah. That's a great, that's a really, it's a really good question. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to answer it by saying that, stating the obvious, which is if you're not good at that, but you have a partner, like a producer or a writing partner that is, then you're okay. But for me, I can only speak for myself and from sort of anecdotally, you know, the many writers, directors that I know, it's extremely important because you will often, the, the reading of a script itself isn't always what you think it is from my experience, which is you may send your, you know, someone at a studio or a company or a rich person or your dentist with money, whoever may read a script and then say, okay, come on in. What they want to hear from you is your vision. And your vision is usually something that is spoken um, and that is an argument for doing the movie. And so... Yeah. Um, often the difference between someone wanting to do it or not doesn't have to do with the written word. It has to do with, especially if it's a director involved, your vision um, and your excitement for, for the project. I think, I think I would be lying to say that that's not important. Um, and it's also a very, very practiced um skill, craft, element, whatever you want to call it, that um, takes, for those that are, of us like me that are kind of slow, years to work on. Um, and that's, you know, there are whole books, courses, et cetera, as you and your, your listeners know, your readers know that, you know, on pitching ideas, um, especially in television, because in television, you normally don't write the script. You normally go in and you pitch your idea and then they hire you to write the script. So if you're inclined towards TV streaming, whatever, that becomes doubly 
more important because you don't walk in with a script and say, you know, Hey, I, I don't speak too well, but this is a great yeah. script. Mm-hmm. They're not, you, you set these meetings. You have, you have to look at it from the executive's perspective. They want to be told a story, right? So you need to te- you need to teach yourself how to tell people stories in a short way that gets them hooked where they go, not only I want to hear more, but maybe I'll write a check for hundreds of thousands of dollars to this person. Like that's insane. And so I learned this the hard way, which is you've got to be good and better at it. So I practice on everybody, you, the Peloton, whoever. I practice all the time trying in a short amount of time to impart a vision for a project in a clear, simple, and concise way um, that gets people excited. And it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of practice. And so to your earlier questions, to those family members or the guy at the pub or whoever that are like, yeah, whatever. eh." So why don't you sit there and fucking convince them of your story? And initially, because because they're naturally inclined against you because they're biology, you know, to not be that interested. But you can see and intuit, like when you mm-hmm. know, a little glint in the eye, a little little way of looking at you, and just practice the theatrics of of, of telling telling people stories in short little bits to get them interested. And it's just like again, like a bricklayer. It's the mortar, you know. It's part of that that process. Um, and again, if you have a partner or another element that can do it for you, it's fine. But if you're on your own, it's something that you really, really have to learn. Yeah. yeah. And it was just, it was one of those things only after you were kind of speaking about the different projects that I kind of realized I kind of snapped out of it. And I was like, wait a sec, I was like so engrossed in that first thing you said (laughs) that I've missed the last like two, three minutes. Um, And it was only then that it kind of came into my mind. I was like, that's something I think that's really underplayed as like a huge and important skill. Yeah, um, I, I think that's, I think that's correct, especially in, I mean, you, ha- you have to understand and it's, that you're trying to get, you need other people in order for your work to come to life. You're not sitting at a canvas. You're, you know, you're not writing a novel. You need, you need other people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Unless you're going to go do your iPhone version of this where you still need other people. You need a DP, you need sound, you need actors. You need, this is a, this is a, this is a, we're around, all around the campfire and you got to get the people around the campfire to go out in the woods and get dinner. Like you need, you need yeah. other people. You need to be able to engage with other people. And that's, and if you don't want to do that and these things are just for you, that's fine. But if you want to go out into the world and, and get money and, and get with actors and get and create something this is, this is not for you diddling with yourself. This is for the world. This is the other people sitting around the campfire looking and wanting us, you know, a fucking story from you. So you got to practice. Yeah. Um, I know you're probably not super active on things like social media or whatever, but is there somewhere that, uh, you know, people can support you, follow you, anything like that? And also, I guess you're, you spoke briefly about it, your next project and when we can expect to see that. Sure. Um, I'll answer that one first. So um, Eraser Reborn, which we shot in Cape Town, uh, which stars Dominic Sherwood from Shadow Hunters, uh, who's an amazing actor. Um, that, um, that is coming out in theaters in Germany um, March 31st and then, uh, and probably other countries at the same time, still, they're still negotiating, but definitely Germany, March 31st. 
Then here in the States, there's a, a, a brief window for on-demand rental, et cetera, on every platform. And then it's coming out on HBO, um, I think in April, May. So it's actually a Warner Brothers HBO movie um, with a window, with a VOD window and international theatrical. Um, so um, essentially it's kind of hitting every, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's hitting every step, every step of the way. Um, and so that's, that's, that's that one. Um, and what was the second question? <laughs> uh, just as regards, uh, social media or, oh, yeah. is yeah. there anywhere so, where people can keep up with you and your work? So, uh, that's a very good question. I, I initially was more involved with social media and, I started to get a little bit um, distracted by the ups and the downs, i.e., you know, it's such a great platform for negativity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and and I just was like, you know what? Um, I'm not enjoying this. Like, I don't. I really, I'm, I'm fine if people don't like something I've done or even hate it. Um, or, you know, and, and some of the criticism is, is, is correct or worth it. And, you know, like I get that that's, that's fine. But why am I spending my time doing this? And so I just sort of, you can see, I mean, I've got a, you know, uh, I've got an Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, but I don't ever post and I don't really accept many followers um, just because it's become a, it's yeah. become a negative process. Uh, and I'm not really learn I'm not learning anything from it. On the other hand, when Deep Blue C3 came out and we had a really great response and people were contacting me, like calling me up on my cell phone and saying, you know, you've got to, get out there more. Um, like we did a, we did a, a Twitter, um, real time Twitter watch with deep blue C, which was a ball. Um, and so I'll do things like that, yeah. um, where it's for people that are interested in having some fun. Maybe I'll learn something from them. They'll learn something from me, uh, where it's an interaction as opposed to just a, you know, uh, platform. Um, so if, you know, if, if people want to, you know, should they want to connect with me or do something, some kind of positive interaction or write me a big check, you know, to do the, uh, Chesapeake blue crab movie. Um, then I think the easiest thing to do is like hit me up on Facebook. I think it's under my name Mm -hmm. or maybe Pogue film. Um, or, and, and, then uh, Instagram as well. Um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to search my name, uh, and then, you know, DM me or, or whatever. Um, and I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to talk with people, interact with people, but I'm not happy to like engage in soup, you know, super negative. Like if someone has, why did you do that? I don't think that worked out. You know, quiet ones could have had a better ending. Like that's, you know, but, but, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. So you're a fucking disgrace. You know, why, why are you still alive? That sort of thing is not a productive use of anyone's time. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I've even me, I've gotten some weird, weird ones. Um, and it's it's, weird, for, it's yeah it's very hard <laughs> to stay away from that stuff and not get consumed by it. Yeah, um, yeah. I have a final question. Sure. Uh, and I guess I, I I don't know it can be twofold or you can just select one or the other. I'm not really sure which of these is more applicable to you. Um, normally the question I ask is why horror and what does it mean to you? But I feel like mm-hmm. you're so multifaceted. Maybe it's a little bit. Uh, I'm kind of pigeonholing you into, you know, why horror when you've done all these other vast things. 
I guess why why movies? Why storytelling? And and like for you personally, what does that what does it mean for you? Hmm. I think that why movies? Because I prefer uh, I I prefer it to reality. Um, so I think, uh, as I've said, I'm incredibly fortunate in so many ways. And like all of us, you know, have have had some ups and downs and some unfortunate things happen as well. And I think that, uh, I prefer it to reality because it, it's anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, hope is eternal. Uh, and, uh, courage is often rewarded. Uh, and, um, I prefer that to sort of the harsh realities of modern life. Um, I think that I would sum up the answer to that question through the journey of Dr. Emma Collins in Deep Blue Sea 3, um, where she is sort of at her heart a environmentalist that cares about the planet, um, um, but she knows that she's fighting a losing battle. And even though she's fighting a losing battle, she keeps fighting. Be, and the way that she can deal with that is to enlist other people to her cause and, um, and, and keep going, um, even though she knows that the end result uh, is not a good one. And so um, uh, I think that, you know, that's her journey is very, you know, is very uh, personal for me because I feel like that's kind of my journey and why movies um, does it solve anything? Does it make things better? Um, that I'm not sure about, um, but uh, I prefer it to the alternative. Yeah, and I think, um, I guess from being on the other side of the the page or the screen or whatever you want to call it, I think maybe, you know, for someone like yourself, a, a creative and whatever, probably sometimes you lose sight of the fact that maybe the effect that some of your work and some of your stuff does for for people. And I feel like I, I keep backtracking on the, the comfort movie thing I said, because um, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't like that sounding like a slight to people. Um, but it that's kind of like how I would explain it. It's like I I prefer being able to live in those worlds sometimes, and and yeah. uh, you know some of the stuff that uh, for me personally, some of the work that you've done has directly tied into personal stuff I've had go on that wasn't so good, and I always can remember using those things as like an escape, and I think that's why I mean. For a lot of people, it probably seems bizarre for somebody to get something like that on their skin for the rest of their life. But for me, it's like, um, I don't know, as cliche as it sounds, like a, a window into the soul, I guess. Um, yeah. And I, I love hearing, I love asking a question like that because you always get a different answer. But at the same time, I feel like, you know, your answer might be one thing, my answer might be another, but there's also... Uh, there's there's a connection there at the same time even though they're two different perspectives we're kind of you know we're, we're looking through the same window mm -hmm. well it's it's shared comfort isn't it as opposed to just individual comfort and maybe that's comforting in its own way is you know i say i prefer reality but um it's not a solo expedition mm -hmm. then when you can share that. And I'm, I'm not offended by the comfort quality um, at all. I mean, the, the, the description at all, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's wonderful, but as you point out, it is, it is a, it's a, 
it's a connection with other people and to some of those values that you're aspiring to and also some of the horrors that you're feeling, right? So it's, it's great to share your fears. I mean, when I have the privilege of being in a theater, in a horror movie or any, you know, any movie that I've worked on and everyone has a, you know, a mutual reaction to something like a scare, mm-hmm. like uh, when, when I'm in a theater and people get scared by something, especially that I've done, you, you just, you feel like that connection with, with all of them together. And just like, it's a great, it's a great and kind of hopeful feeling like, wow, we're, we're, there's a togetherness here um, that you often don't get, you know, in, in other elements or other parts of life. So thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, it's been a, an incredible conversation. You've given up so much time and you've, you've given so much, I think, uh, actionable advice, whether you realize it or not. I think, uh, a lot of people will take, um, a lot of things from this, um, for everybody listening, all the links to John's stuff that he spoke about will be in the description, and I will keep changing it out when we get closer to um, Eraser Reborn coming out. I will have links for the different areas and locations of who can get what where. Um, the one thing I will ask is, before we sign off on this episode, so I know, obviously, I can see the analytics. I know that there's thousands of people downloading each of these episodes, what everybody needs to do is go and give Village Roadshow and Warner Brothers or whoever loads of shit about Ghost Ship and we need to get this movie made ASAP. Because I do I do honestly think it's funny, but I do honestly think that um, social media and the audience does have a huge sway recently. Um, I've even seen with things like as ridiculous as TikTok, which I don't really know anything about, but I've seen projects come together over like massive I, I recently seen a guy in in the UK um get a a tree picture deal with some company because he put a short film on TikTok and it got like a hundred million views or something and it just like began spiraled into this thing. So everybody that listens to this needs to go and send emails, DMs, comments, everything. On Village Roadshow, Warner Brothers, anywhere basically. Reddit, everywhere. Amen. Um, like I said, John, it's been a, a, an absolute pleasure and an honor as well uh, to pick your brain. And um, I wish you all the success, all the health and happiness. And I hope we can do it again, maybe down the line when we get a little bit closer to some of these other projects where you can actually talk about them properly. Uh, I would I would love that. Um, I, I Your questions were were so insightful and um, I just, you know, this is a very, very interesting uh, and deep conversation for me. Um, and uh, thanks to you and, and, and uh, your listeners. Um, uh, and let's all keep telling stories together if we can. Thanks, John. Okay. Take care. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. 